doctors used to tell women not to pick up their babies on demand. They still do. Now, you can't tell a mother orangutan that or a mother bear that, but you can tell it to a human being. Hello and welcome to the Ultimate Health Podcast, episode 259. Jesse Chapp is here with Marnie Wasserman, and we are here on a weekly basis to take your health to the next level. This week, our featured guest is Dr. Gabor Mate. He's a renowned speaker, best-selling author, and highly sought after for his expertise on a range of topics including addiction, stress, and childhood development. Today, we're focusing in on his book, In the Realm of Hungry Ghosts and Addiction. And this is such an important topic to address, and addiction is something that a lot of people experience, and addiction doesn't just mean drugs and alcohol. There are so many different behaviors that fall under this category, from eating disorders to even social media, and we're going to get into a lot of this on today's show. So we talk about the behavior of addiction and why some people become addicted, the negative impact of social media on our culture and on ourselves, what most conventional treatments for addicts look like what Gabor's approach to addiction is like, and you'll find out what the most important thing is to address first, how to recognize someone with addiction and the role of family support, and the difference between addiction and passion. You guys are in for a really important episode. Here we go with Dr. Gabor Mate. Hello, Gabor. Welcome to the podcast. How are you today? I'm very well, and thanks for having me. It's so great to have you on the show, and we're getting into a whole new topic we haven't covered on the podcast to this point and that is addiction. And we're just so grateful to have somebody who's such an expert in the area on the show. So we're going to get right into things. But to make sure we're all on the same page to kick off, let's talk about what's at the root or the core of an addiction. Well, let's take even a step back from that and talk about what an addiction is. Let me give you a definition of an addiction, a process that's manifested in any behavior that a person finds temporary pleasure or relief in, and therefore craves but suffers negative consequences in the long term and cannot give it up. So it's craving, short-term relief and pleasure, negative consequences, inability to give it up. And I said any behavior, I didn't say drugs. So it could be drugs, could be gambling, sex, shopping, eating, internet, gaming, pornography, any number of human behaviors. And so if you want to get to the core of it, let me ask you guys a question, okay? By that definition, would either of you agree that you've ever had an addiction in your life? And I don't care what to, I'm not going to ask what to or when. By that definition, do you recognize it in your life you've ever had an addiction to anything? Sure, I would say yes. So I would say no in my case. So Jesse, I'm not going to ask you what you were addicted to. I'm just going to ask you what you got from it. What did it give you in the short term? What did you like about it? For me, my addiction, I would say, is I can get into it a little bit here, and that is caffeine. It's something I've been addicted to on and off over the years. And what I got from it was energy. Were there negative consequences? The fact that you get into a whole spiral when you start using caffeine on a regular basis where you need more of it to have that energy that you once got from less and you kind of get into a spiral where you need to have more and more to keep up that energy level. Did it also help you focus by any chance? Yes. Well, you just told me two things. And this goes back to the question about what is at the core of addiction. So addiction is always an attempt to solve a problem. So the addiction is not the primary problem. The addiction is your attempt to solve a problem. In your case, you're trying to solve the problem of lack of energy and possibly lack of focus. So the real question is not why you were addicted to caffeine or why you lacked energy in your life and why you had trouble focusing. So the core issue is what is the problem that addiction is trying to solve? So just by looking at the behavior of addiction, we're not looking at the core of it because everybody who uses any kind of behavior, whether it's sex, shopping, gambling, pornography, cell phones, whatever it is, is trying to solve a problem. So the core of addiction is always a problem in that person's life. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, I'm not going to take this any further than you want to take it, but when somebody tells me they use caffeine for energy and focusing, I want to know if they have ADD or not. Because a lot of people with attention deficit disorder, and I've been diagnosed with it myself, they self-medicate with stimulants. Caffeine is one of them. So it's also possible, and we can explore that if you want, or leave it alone for now, that you're self-medicating yourself with the caffeine. It's a solution to a problem, not a good solution, but an attempted solution to a problem. That's what's at the core of addiction. I've never been diagnosed with ADD or thought that was a possibility, but interesting perspective. Possibly not, but you know, I would ask you a bunch of questions like, when you were not interested in something, did you have trouble focusing? And at school, were you told that if you only paid attention, you'd do so much better because you were so smart, you're not living up to your potential? And 
at asking all these questions. I'm not diagnosing you. All I'm saying is that in many cases, when people use stimulants, it's a self-medication. But in all cases, it's an attempt to solve a problem. And then I would ask, well, why do you like energy? I mean, you're a healthy human being, I take it. What is it that makes you feel that you don't have any enough energy in your life? And again, that's not something I insist on getting in with you in a personal conversation. I'm just illustrating the point that addictions are always an attempt to solve a problem. And in the book, you talk about this problem typically happening in childhood and some kind of trauma happening that either we're aware of or that we're not aware of. So let's talk about these childhood roots. Sure. First of all, we have to understand that the word trauma, it's a very charged word. And you ask a lot of people, were you traumatized? They would say no, because they think of trauma as something terrible happening to you, like sexual abuse or physical abuse or emotional abuse or somebody dying or you know something dire happening. Now, in the downtown east side of Vancouver, where I worked as a doctor for 12 years, those people were severely traumatized. All the women I worked with had been sexually abused, without a single exception, in 12 years. So the hardcore addicts, the ones that we think of as addicts, we don't like to think of ourselves as addicts, even though most of us are. The hardcore addicts, they usually have suffered severe trauma, identifiable severe trauma. And that's just not my opinion. That's what the studies also show. The word trauma comes from the word wound. It's a Greek word, I think, for wound. And so trauma really is woundedness. And we all suffer wounds in childhood to different degrees. And that wound can be overt, like sexual abuse, or it could be just that your parents couldn't see you for who you were, and they couldn't accept you exactly the way you were. So that hurts a child. That doesn't mean the parents didn't love you. That doesn't mean they didn't do their best. But it meant that you suffered the wound of not being seen, of not being understood. But that's, to a small, sensitive child, is very painful. And so when I talk about trauma, it's that woundedness that I talk about. So just to get into some different things, you know, this is a really important point because I think when people think of trauma, as you said, a lot of people think of something very drastic happening to themselves. Whereas when it's the subtle things that kind of happen, maybe at an early age, and this is something else that you bring up in the book, is when the brain is developing, when something happens, this is what can really imprint on the person who might eventually develop an addiction. So can we just elaborate as well to what's happening in the brain during development? Well, let me give you a personal example. So I was born in 1944. And recently, I read my mother's diary that she kept of my first year or two of life. When I was six weeks of age, she said, my poor little Gabor, she says, my heart was breaking for you because you were crying from three o'clock in the morning. But I couldn't pick you up until five o'clock because the doctor's told me that I have to feed you on schedule. So you cried for an hour and three quarters until I finally picked you up because I couldn't stand it anymore. But she says, I can't do it again because the doctors would be so angry with me. What's it like for a six-week-old not to be picked up when they're crying, to be fed and to be held because the woman is too intimidated by the doctor? Now, doctors used to tell women not to pick up their babies on demand. They still do. Now, you can't tell a mother orangutan that or a mother bear that, but you can tell it to a human being. Now, what happens to the brain of a six-week-old? What message does he get? The message he gets is that he doesn't matter, that his feelings are not important, and that he's not lovable. Because if he was, he'd be picked up and held and fed. Now, this is a woman, my mother, who deeply loved me. She did her best. She was in love with me. I can tell by her diary. But because she was following doctor's orders, this is the message that I received very early on. That has an impact not only on the psychological messages that we imprint in our brains, it also has an impact on the brain chemicals that develop when we're young. So the brain develops an interaction with the environment, and which circuits develop and which do not has a lot to do with the kind of emotional nurturing we receive or we don't receive. So the dopamine circuits, which are incentive and motivation and energy, by the way. And the opiate circuits that have to do with love and pain relief and pleasure and the stress circuits, these circuits, their physiological development depend on the nurturing relationship with the adult. And if the adults are prevented by the stresses in their lives, by economic insecurity, by their own trauma, by their own stresses, by their own relationship problems, from giving the child the kind of attuned, consistent, nurturing attention the child needs, that'll have an impact on the child's brain development. And that child will then be more prone to have emotional and mental health problems and addiction problems. So you mentioned earlier that you have been diagnosed with ADD. So what's the correlation there for you? Based on that experience that you just shared with us, what do you think that that led to that addiction for yourself? 
one of the hallmarks of ADD is difficulty paying attention. Then my mind very easily gets into a two-knot mode where I'm just not present to what's going on. Tuning out, now, now most physicians look on ADD as kind of an inherited disease. No, it isn't. What tuning out is, is a defense mechanism. If I were to stress you right now, if, if I were to become aggressive towards you guys right now, you have a simple option. You just hang up on me. You would leave, in other words, right? Or you could fight back and tell me not to talk to you that way. But what do you do when you can't get help, when you can't fight back and you can't escape? In other words, when you're a two-month-old or a two-year-old and difficult, stressful stuff is happening around you. Or one of the ways you deal with it, you don't do it deliberately, your brain tunes you out so you're not present, so you're not suffering so much. But this is happening when the brain is developed. So then the tuning guard becomes programmed into the brain. And now later on, you're diagnosed with the so-called disease. That's my first book, Scattered Minds and Attention Deficit Disorder. ADD is a risk factor for addictions. People with ADD are more prone to become addicted. Why? Because addiction is always an attempt to solve a problem. And ADD is a problem that people are trying to solve unconsciously. Or they have emotional pain. I mean, that just not being picked up by my mother when I needed to be. And there was lots of other stuff that happened in my infancy, by the way, which I talk about in the book. But just not being picked up by my mother when I needed to be and my mother not being happy around me because she couldn't be because it was wartime and it was a terrible time in her life. That gives me the message that I don't make somebody happy. I'm not very lovable. And that's painful. And therefore, I try to deal with that pain later on in life by all kinds of compensating behaviors. And those compensating behaviors, whether in my case, shopping and work and so on, they become addictive. You mentioned shopping there. You talk about in the book, In the Realm of Hungry Ghosts, how you actually had an addiction to obtaining classical music. So I'd love for you to further elaborate on that. Sure. So people say, well, what kind of an addiction is classical music? I wasn't addicted to classical music. I love classical music. I'm passionate about it. But that's not what the addiction was. The addiction was to the shopping. So it doesn't matter how many I had. And even if I just spent $1,000 in the store on a bunch of discs and lied to my wife about it, which of course I did, all addicts lie, I'd have to go back half an hour later and get some more. I literally couldn't stop myself. I would even neglect my duties at work for the sake of my addiction and lie about it, of course. And I talk about it in the book. And it's like with the caffeine that you mentioned, Jesse. The more you get, the more you need. So it becomes a little spiral, as you put it. So the more I went shopping for compact discs, the more I had to go back. So one week, I spent $8,000. In my whole lifetime, I'd never have time to listen to all the music that I bought. So it wasn't about the music. It was about the shopping. I just had to keep going back and going back and going back. And that going back temporarily made me feel very alive, very excited, very motivated. And excitement and feeling of aliveness and motivation, those are factors missing in my life. And so the addiction was a way of supplanting that, of giving myself that false sense of motivation and false aliveness that you get from the addiction, just as you might get false energy really from the caffeine because the energy is already in you. It's just kind of blocked. So this gets me thinking about why some people are addicted to certain behaviors, substances, what have you, versus others. So is there a correlation, and I know you do get into some of this in the book, but between specific addictions and childhood experiences that you're seeing over and over again, you know, with alcohol, it's always this, with heroin, it's always this. I don't have a satisfactory, it's a really good question, but I don't have a satisfactory answer for it. I know that in my case, what's interesting is that my father wrote in in this diary that they kept that if I was crying, if they turned on the radio and there was music on, that would soothe me. So that gives me a kind of clue as to why I've become addicted to buying music. But not in every case is there such a correlation. I think a lot has to do with at what time the trauma happened, what circuits were you developing in your brain at that time, and also, of course, availability, like alcohol. You might have grown up in a home where you see people drinking. So that seems natural to you. So if you have emotional pain and you want to soothe it, you'll turn to alcohol. For a lot of women, what becomes addictive is eating disorders. Like bulimia is an addictive problem where people are craving their relief and they engage in it temporarily. It's got negative consequences. Of course, food is available everywhere. And one of the ways that you can act out your trauma is through your relationship to food, whether it's through an eating disorder or through overeating. So part of it has to do with availability. Part of it is, I think, has to do with the stage of development that you're at when your troubles became apparent or became active in your life. But... Beyond that, I do not have a satisfactory answer. Now we're going to take a quick break from our chat with Gabor 
to give a shout out to our show sponsor, Four Sigmatic. When we were away in Bali, I brought packets of all kinds of Four Sigmatic products with me. And one of my favorite ones is the mushroom matcha latte. And this was so easy on the go because I could just open it up, add a little bit of coconut milk or almond milk, which was really easy to find in Bali, and make it for a morning drink. But now that I'm back home, I'm opening up the mushroom matcha and I'm mixing it with coconut milk, coconut butter, and collagen and making a blended drink. It's extremely versatile, really easy to drink because it tastes so good. So if you haven't tried it yet, get your hands on the mushroom matcha. And as a listener of our show, you get 10% off all your Four Sigmatic purchases. To take advantage, it's really easy to do. Just go to ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash Four Sigmatic. Again, that URL is ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash four sigmatic for listeners in the u.s and canada you can bundle your order together spend a hundred dollars or more and you get free shipping four sigmatic products rock go and get yours today and now a shout out to our show partner thrive market if you're in the usa and you're starting to get ready for halloween get online to thrive market today you can search under the topic of halloween and you can get a couple of ideas of healthier treats that you can give out at your door on halloween night and you can stock up on these in addition to so many other amazing products at thrive market they have everything and if you're looking for a sweet treat yourself you're going to find better options for chocolate different kinds of candy including gummies and even chips if you've got more of a salty tooth so look for these items over at thrive market and you're getting 20 to 50 percent off of regular retail value in addition You're getting 25% off your entire order plus a 30-day free trial and free shipping. So get Halloween ready with Thrive Market. What an incredible deal you get as a listener of our show. And to take advantage, it's super easy to do. Just go to ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash Thrive Market. Again, that URL is ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash Thrive Market. Go and load up your cart today. You can thank us later. And now back to our chat with Gabor. And how many people out there would you say have some form of addiction? With the way that this conversation is going, it seems like there's so many different kinds of addiction out there. Is there anybody that actually is immune to having any addiction at all? Marnie says she is. I want to ask her how she did it. But she'd be in a small minority because everywhere I speak, and if I give them this definition of addiction, most people in the room will put their hand up. Look, we live in a culture that actually feeds on addiction because a lot of people are buying stuff they don't need and they crave stuff they don't need. I mean, who needs the latest iPhone? Nobody needs it. But as soon as it comes out, you can go to the store and there's a lineup around the corner. People have to get the latest gadget. It's a completely unnecessary need. It's not a need. It's a desire. But people confuse in this culture. And the job of a lot of the economy in this culture is to make people think that the desires are equivalent to their needs. But they're not. So this society feeds addictions in a big way. And it also feeds addictions in a big way because very few children get the conditions that they need for healthy development in this culture because of the stresses on the parents. So both in terms of creating the emotional pain and the woundedness that I talked about, and in terms of giving them people outlets for those addictive desires, this society is marvelous at it. It's a brilliantly organized system to create and to feed people's addictions. Then we point our fingers at the drug addicts and say, what's wrong with you people? Well, it just brings up the point that I think I actually am addicted to something and that's social media. And I think I speak for so many people listening. And, you know, it's one of those ones that you don't think of because I'm going through my mind thinking of all the other behaviors or substances. And I'm like, no, no, no. But social media, I'm definitely addicted to that for sure. That craving, that urge to want to post something, share something. And then I do, I'm trying to create a lot of structures right now in my life, both Jesse and myself. This is important to us to limit the amount of exposure we have to social media, but it's for sure an addiction. And just as you were saying, you know, society has created this now. And I know I speak for probably everyone listening to this episode right now, (laughs) that this is the problem of the century. Listen, it's a huge one. And in my next book, I'll be writing about it. But let me ask you a question then, since you acknowledge it. What is the negative? What's the downside of it for you? What's the negative impact? Well, it again, the vicious cycle of that need, that compulsion to want to check or to post something, to strip away at that. Is it for validation? Is it for growing the brand on some level? But for what? I don't know. How do you feel when you don't post? What's missing for you there? But the other question is, what does it take away? Because most of the people that I know who are addicted to social media, it wastes a lot of time. It keeps them from real contact with people. It keeps them from quiet spiritual time with themselves. It may interfere with their duties and responsibilities. It's a huge one. 
in this culture. Yeah, and I can totally relate to that. It's true. And that's why it's become, I'd say over the last year, a big goal of mine to really limit and pay attention to how much I'm using it because that's just it. It takes away from the realness of our relationship, mine and Jesse's, from spending time with friends or always needing to capture the moment when you can just be in the moment. But it's interesting because there is that fine balance where it is great to connect with the community and to share different aspects of our life and what's going on. So I guess it's finding that healthy relationship, which it just seems like such a subjective thing. Where is that line? I don't know. Well, community is a human need. We're connected creatures. We're wired to connect. Our brains are wired to connect. We suffer when we don't connect. But cultures have always supported connection. People have always lived in hunter-gatherer groups in clans, in extended families, in communities, in neighborhoods. And the social media epidemic really is a a signal how far our need for connectedness is not met by the culture that we live in. And the problem with the social media connection is it can be very unreal because people present their images and their ideas and so on on social media, but not necessarily their true inner selves. Because human beings are designed to connect, not through words on a page, but to hearing each other's voice, seeing each other's faces, responding to body language, responding to the tone of how the other person speaks. These are all the nuts and bolts of connection. Social media doesn't give you any of that. No, it's a very false sense of that. And I find that the more real that I think that I'm getting through social media, Sometimes that does work in a certain way because I'm being vulnerable and I'm opening up the doors to connect with people in this digital world. But at the same time, it does limit that capacity to connect with people on a real level. So I'm really happy that you're going to be writing about this, that we're talking about this right now, because I think it's very valid and very apparent. Well, and the other part of it is that it's precisely because it doesn't quite work that makes it so addictive. In other words, it almost works. It makes it feel like it's working temporarily, but it doesn't really. And as one of my medical colleagues who researches addiction said, it's hard to get enough of something that almost works. And because it almost works, you want more and more and more. If it worked, you wouldn't need it. If it gave you that sense of connection, it would satisfy you and you could forget about it for the rest of the day. But besides it, because it doesn't quite give it to you, you have to keep doing it and doing it and doing it. Gabor, I'm going to take a bit of a left turn here. And I want to talk about conventional treatment of addicts. And let's start out talking about conventional doctors and their training when they're going to medical school. Are they trained at all how to deal with addiction or what does that look like? I certainly wasn't. When I went to medical school in the 70s, there wasn't a single lecture on addiction. Now I think there are maybe one or two lectures or maybe an elective or something. But given how prevalent the problem is, the medical training that future physicians receive is pitifully minuscule, number one. Number two, Even what they train and they get is completely misleading because at the very best, they'll be given kind of a biological disease model of addiction. This is astonishing to say in 2018, but the average medical student in four years does not hear a single lecture on psychological trauma. Despite the prevalence of trauma in our society, despite the abundant evidence linking trauma, not just to addiction, but to mental illness in general, and even to physical illness. For example, Canadian studies show that if you're abused as a child, your risk of cancer goes up nearly 50%. So despite the epidemiological data linking trauma to all kinds of health problems, despite the physiological data showing how trauma actually impacts people's physiology and brain physiology, despite all that, the average medical student does not hear the word trauma, does not even hear the word in all their training, which is, to say the least, astonishing. Then these people are expected to treat addicts with what information? Yeah, that's where I was going to go next. How does that trickle down to conventional treatment these days? So conventional treatment has to do with just trying to stop the behavior of addiction. So let's how do we get you to stop drinking? How do you get you to stop using drugs or going to pornography sites or whatever? And the treatments don't work because they don't always don't work. Sometimes they do work, but the risk of relapse is very high. What's also very high is the risk that even if you give up one addiction, you go on to another one. Why? Because the the fundamental problem that the addiction was trying to solve in your life, the loneliness, the disconnection from yourself, the alienation, the boredom, the emotional pain, they haven't been dealt with. So how would stopping one behavior alone deal with the fundamental problem? Now, if you're drinking a lot, if you can give up the drinking, that's great. 
but you haven't healed. And those problems will still show up in your life. Typically, for example, I don't know if you know smokers who keep quit smoking, but what typically happens to a smoker when they quit smoking? I would guess maybe they start eating more and gain weight. That's exactly what happens because they're still trying to soothe the same pain. Now, it's a good thing they give up the smoking. Overeating is not healthy, but it's less unhealthy than smoking is. That's not a bad thing, but it still leaves you in the clutches of an addiction. So say when you're working with a patient with an addiction, how is your whole approach different? So going back right in the beginning, you're starting to work with somebody new. Are you trying to go back to those childhood traumas and begin there and see what's going on? Or what does the beginning part look like? Well, first of all, I want to know what their intentions are, why they're seeing me, what do they want? What is their goal? Not what my goal is for them, but what is their goal for themselves? Number one, number two, I would ask them the same question I asked you, which is, what is the addiction doing for you? People usually say it numbs me. Well, when do people need numbing? They need numbing when they're in pain. In other words, the things that people want from the addiction are perfectly valid human qualities, connection, pain relief, protection from stress. These are the things that the addiction in a short term does for people. In the long term, it robs them of it. But in the short term, that's what people get from it. I say to them, okay, look, what you want is perfectly valid. There's nothing wrong with it. The question is, how did you lose that in the first place? And secondly, how can we help you regain those qualities without that addictive uh, false solution? So that's the overall approach. And yes, at some point, that'll take looking into people's childhood experience. And not just a childhood experience, because if it's only about childhood, it's kind of irrelevant because that happened a long time ago. What can we do about it? Nothing. It's not the question of what happened in childhood. It's what impacts did that have on you that you're still carrying with you? What did it make you believe about yourself that you still believe? So it's not about the past. It's about the present. How does the childhood show up in your present day life? And how can we help you get into the present rather than still living out of the past? So what other modalities or alternative therapies are there available for people? When it comes to trauma treatment, there's a lot now. None of them are perfect. Therefore, I can't just say, just do this and be okay. But because of the prevalence of trauma in this culture, and because a lot of people have been asking the same questions I have about how you treat trauma, there's a lot of new modalities. There's something called EMDR. There's something called emotional freedom technique. There's something called uh, internal family systems treatment. There's brain spotting. There are various neurofeedback techniques. There's an increasing interest in the use of certain psychedelic modalities in treating addiction. But all I'm saying is that whatever the treatment is, it has to address the trauma. Can we elaborate on psychedelics? We're hearing so much about that now, and it's getting a lot of attention in the mental health world. Can we just talk about maybe some of the different forms and if there's ones that someone might want to consider or just how they can impact someone with addiction? Sure. The reason there's such interest in them, as you say, because there is, is due to the failure of really of Western medicine to deal with mental health problems or addictions. The best modalities we have in Western medicine control symptoms, but that's all they do. So somebody has psychosis, in some cases, we can control their psychosis with uh, antipsychotic medications. Not in all cases, but in some cases we can. If somebody has severe depression, antidepressants can be quite helpful. I've taken them. I know they can be helpful. But they just treat the symptom. They don't treat the underlying condition. The reasons you got depressed, the trauma that caused it, the medications don't deal with. And a lot of people, they don't work for anyway. The Western psychiatric model is very narrowly biological in its approach for the most part. And it's rather unsuccessful for a lot of people. It's one area of medicine that really is disappointing for a lot of people once they get exposed to it. So therefore, there's an interest in alternatives. And one of these alternatives are the psychedelics. I became interested in them really when my book came out, the book we're talking about right now, In the Realm of Hunger Ghosts. That book has nothing about psychedelics in it because I knew nothing about them when I wrote the book. It was only after the book was published that people kept asking me what I knew about psychedelics, specifically a Peruvian or an Amazonian plant called ayahuasca and the healing of addiction. And I knew nothing. And the question began to annoy me because I said to people, or I thought to myself at least, I've just spent three years writing a significant book on addiction, pouring all my heart and soul and knowledge into it. And now you're asking me about something I don't know anything about. Why don't you ask me something I know about? Anyway, people wouldn't leave me alone. They kept asking. 
And finally, I had an opportunity to experience this brew, this shamanic brew myself. And within half an hour, I got it. I got it to why people were asking me. So I've worked with ayahuasca ever since for the last 10 years. I got to say, first of all, A, it's not for everybody. B, it's not a panacea. There are no panaceas. But I've seen a lot of people helped with sex addiction, with substance addictions, with eating disorders, depression, anxiety, all kinds of things. In the right context, under the right guidance, these modalities can be helpful. In the wrong context, with the wrong guidance or no guidance, they could be quite harmful. What about the use of psilocybin, whether it's in a full dose or microdosing? Is that something you're familiar with? I worked with psilocybin myself in terms of as a healing modality. So when somebody takes psilocybin, all these psychedelics, they each in their own separate way, they take you beyond the ordinary consciousness. And you really get to see yourself in a much deeper way. And you get access to memories and emotions that are sort of blocked off because they were too painful to start with. And so mushrooms, psychedelics, you know, psilocybin in the right context, again, can be very helpful. And a lot of people will tell you that. They've done studies with it now at Johns Hopkins University in treating anxiety at people with the, at the end of life. It's been shown to be quite successful, which also tells me that it should be helpful with anxiety in other contexts as well. People are studying MDMA, which is ecstasy, in post-traumatic stress disorder. These studies are quite promising. But again, they all go beyond the ordinary consciousness. That's how they help. They get you to see aspects of yourself and aspects of reality that otherwise you're just not aware of. Now, microdosing, I have no opinion about. There's no clear studies on that. People talk about it, people praise it, but I haven't seen anything systemic that would tell me that it's helpful or when it is helpful. But some people swear by it. Now we're going to take another quick break from our chat with Gabor to give a shout out to our show partner, Core Chair. It feels great to be back on our core chairs after being gone a month. It's so nice to be able to sit on them during our podcast recordings. This is where Jesse and I sit. We're super comfortable on them. We're getting in some active sitting. Our bodies feel good because there's blood flow and we got blood flow going to our brain and we can speak better and think better. So it's really good to be back on them. And if you haven't experienced your core chair yet, give it a try. You're going to love it. Something that you can sit on while you are at work or while you're at home, sitting at your desk. And right now, there's an amazing Thanksgiving sale going on, $150 off the regular price of the chair, and this goes all the way to October 12, 2018. Great time to take advantage if you've been sitting on the fence. And as a listener of our show, you also get a special listener discount on top of that, and these chairs ship free in North America. Now is the time to get one of these amazing core chairs. To take advantage of this awesome deal, all you need to do is go to ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash core chair. Again, that URL is ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash core chair. Go and get your core chair today. You are going to love it. And now a shout out to our other show partner, Sun Warrior. Now that we're back in the routine of things after being in Bali, it's good to be using liquid light again. This is such a great way to add minerals to our water in the morning. It feels really good to get those in because we've been drinking a lot of really filtered water while we were in Bali, so I don't think it had very many minerals in it. So it's great to use the liquid light, get that dose in. All you need to do is add a capful into your water and sip on it throughout the day or first thing in the morning. That's typically how we like to enjoy it. So if you haven't tried the liquid light yet, add it to your cart and give it a try. And as a listener of our show, you get 10% off all your Sun Warrior purchases. To take advantage, go to ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash SW. Again, that URL is ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash SW. If you're a listener in the U.S. or Canada, you can bundle your order together, spend $100 or more, and you get free shipping. Go and order yourself some liquid light right now. And now back to our chat with Gabor. So what this is going to show is that the brain can actually change through different modalities, whether it's psychedelics or EFT or so many different modalities, meditation, yoga. So this is something once someone is on a certain trajectory to healing or to helping their addiction can the brain actually change? Is this what's happening? Like we can change the way the thought patterns are, the way the behaviors are? Well, the awareness that the brain is capable of changing even later on in life, which is called neuroplasticity, which is the capacity of the the nervous system to change, that's been well known for a few decades now. So from animal studies and human experience. So yes, the brain can change, which is good news, because it means that it doesn't matter what happened to early in your life. And even if your brain was wired or miswired in certain ways, in most cases, that can change positively, provided you're given the right kind of experiences. 
So the brain is an experience-dependent organ. If you want to find out how, learn to play the piano. If you practice enough, there'll be new brain circuits where your fingers can automatically just go to the right keys at the right time. Whereas right now you'd have to figure out key by key and finger by finger, right? Just because you're not trained in it. So that means your brain has developed new circuitry. And the same dynamic can happen in the behaviors that control addictions, the stress regulation and the impulse control and, and so on. So yes, we can develop new circuits. We can heal the old ones, at least so that they don't control our lives anymore. Or even if they're still present, they don't have to dominate our functioning. I mean, I can recognize in myself a lot of the same patterns that have always been there, but they no longer dominate my life. Or when they do take over for a while, I'm much quicker at being able to separate myself from them. And that's good because I'm 74 and my brain is still changing. That can certainly happen. And the younger you are, of course, the more potential for change there is. I'd love for you to talk about the role of family support in this whole equation. So if there's somebody out there who has a friend or family member who they know has an addiction and they need help, what role can that family member have? Like, I'm assuming helping them get support is an initial step, but let's talk about that and let's talk about what other roles the family can have in this whole process. Well, it's an important question. And the first thing is to realize the role of the family, not just in helping the addict, but in creating the addiction in the first place. Because what I'm saying is, and I'm saying this as a parent, and I'm saying this as an individual, I'm saying this as a researcher and a physician, the trauma is multi-generational. And most people's traumatic experiences occur in the family of origin. Because I know how I passed on my own trauma to my own kids. I didn't mean to, but I did. I'm not blaming myself. I'm just saying that's what happened. And that's what happens in most families. The family has to know that it's not only an important part of the solution, which it is, but it was also part of creating the problem in the first place, not deliberately, but unwittingly, because they hadn't dealt with their own trauma yet. So that when somebody is recognized as an addict, it's not enough to go to them and say, hey, we're here to help you. So much more powerful it is to say, hey, we recognize that your addiction represents a problem in our whole family. We all need to heal. So let's heal together. I think that's the best possible support. What I say to families is family members and friends, and I, there's a chapter in the book for families and friends, the second to last chapter is specifically for that. But what I say to people is there are three ways you can relate to the addict. Two of them are sane, the third one is insane. It's completely sane and acceptable to say to an addicted family member or friend, look, I love you very much, but your behavior is so painful for me, it stresses me so much, I can't deal with it. And I can't have you in my life when you're in this behavior. I just can't do it. That's not your problem. It's my problem. But that's how it is for me. That's legitimate. It's also legitimate to say, hey, I get that you've got this addiction problem right now. At least I see it that way. I get that for you. This is the way you're trying to solve some inner issue. I can't judge that. I can't change it. I'm not going to try. I'm just going to be here for you. And I'm going to love you. And I'm not going to try and change you. Because whether you change or not, ultimately, that's up to you. And I can't influence that. And if I push on you, you're just going to resent me and push back at me. So I'm going to be with you. I'm going to support you in ways that seem reasonable to me, but I'm not going to try and change you. That's the second approach, which is also sane. What is insane is to say to somebody, I'm going to stay in your life and I'm going to keep trying to change you every day. Every time I talk to you, I'm going to put pressure on you to change. I tell you, that's called codependency and it creates more problems than you can imagine. Thanks for that breakdown. And while we're on the topic of family, let's shift into the genetic role when it comes to addiction and really get into this. And I've heard you talk about before how genes really only play a small role in the whole picture of this, and they have to do with how sensitive the individual is. So I'd just love for you to elaborate on that. Sure. So again, the standard medical view is that addictions are largely genetically inherited, probably 40 to 70% genetically influenced. I think it's probably 4 or 5% at the most. Because what those studies don't look at is the role of brain development early in life and in the uterus. So most people who are addicted probably don't have any genes at all. And even if you have certain genes that predispose to addiction, which there may be such genes, we know from animal and human studies that even if you have such genes, if you're brought up in a nurturing environment, your risk of addiction is no greater than that of anybody else. So the point is that the genes don't determine anything. It's possible they make you more vulnerable. So when bad stuff happens, you're more likely to become addicted. That's a matter of sensitivity. And sensitivity is from the Latin word sensir to feel. The more sensitive you are by nature 
And that could be partly genetic. The more you're going to feel when things go wrong, the more pain you have, the more you have to escape. The more you have to escape, the more likely it is that you'll be addicted. So sensitivity, although it doesn't cause addiction, it can make you more prone to it because you'll be hurting more than somebody else would at the same circumstance. It also means, by the way, that why so many artists and the musicians are addicted is because these are very sensitive people. To create that kind of art, you have to be sensitive. But that same sensitivity also means that you can have more pain in this life. Thank you for explaining that. And something I want to get into as well is meditation. I know we brushed upon it as a modality for healing, but firstly, has it played a big role in your life and what forms of meditation have you used? I have a deep relationship with meditation. I think about it every day. I'm a very poor meditator. My ADD mind just jumps like a monkey. If I meditate for 20 minutes, if I'm present for half a minute, I've achieved something. However, I have found yoga to be helpful. Yoga is more active. It involves the body more. It allows me more present with the body. And so about a year and a half ago, almost getting close to two years now, actually, I met an Indian, a very famous Indian yogi who suggested I do the yoga that he developed. And I started doing it on a daily basis. And it's made a huge difference in my life. And I'm telling you right now, the last two weeks I haven't done it. And I'm noticing myself spiraling down. So I'm pledging you guys <laughs> today after this conversation, when I have some time this afternoon, I'm going to do my yoga again. So some kind of mindfulness practice is what I'm saying. For some people, meditation. We know that meditation can rewire the brain in a positive sense. And it can also put you in touch with more with yourself. For me, it's yoga, which involves 20 minutes of breath meditation, but it has to be in the context of the yoga. That's what works for me. The caveat, the warning that I would put out is a lot of people meditate and they achieve states of calm and bliss on the cushion. But if they haven't dealt with the underlying trauma, it's not going to make the difference that they think it'll make because you can kind of bypass your emotional issues by spiritual work, but you got to deal with them both. So if you only do the spiritual work and if you don't do the emotional work, you're not going to move forward that much. It doesn't matter how beautiful you feel on the cushion. That's such a good point. I'm glad you brought that up. And I'd love for you to discern the difference between having an addiction and for somebody just being really passionate about, say, a hobby or something they're doing in their day-to-day -day life. I just, I'm sure a lot of listeners out there are probably thinking at this point, you know, I'm really into this or that. Is this just a passion for me or is this actually an addiction? Well, a passion doesn't control you. A passion is something you're excited about, you engage in enthusiastically, you're fully alive when you're doing it, but it doesn't run your life, number one. Number two, it has no negative consequences. If you're passionate about gardening, you're not doing it to hurt yourself. You're not doing it at the same time ignoring your relationship with your spouse. If you're gardening and you're creating beauty and, and you're getting your hands into the earth and you're communing with nature, but you're not causing problems for yourself, then that's not an addiction. That's a passion. Passions are important to human beings. They empower people. Addictions disempower people. There's a huge difference. So I'm passionate about classical music. My addiction is not to the music. It was to the shopping for music. If there's a negative consequence and you have no power over it, it's an addiction. So in wrapping up, just before we let you go, is there anything else that we can leave the audience with, something else you want to just share with them before we end this conversation? I'd like people to know that for all my books, including this one, they can read chapters online at my website. I've given lots of YouTube lectures on this and other subjects, which are also freely viewable. Nobody has to pay anything or join anything at the website. This book has just been published as a 10th anniversary edition. It sold over a quarter of a million copies in the States and Canada. A lot of people have, I know have derived a lot of benefit from it. Some people tell me it saved their lives. I'm hoping people will check it out, whether online, on YouTube, when I talk about it, or in the library, or if they purchase a copy. But I think it speaks to a lot of people in the society. So I, I hope people will... Uh, Check it out. And I've written a new introduction for the 10th anniversary edition. Yes. And we hope our listeners get a copy of In the Realm of Hungry Ghosts. This is a fabulous read. But that is how people can connect with you. What about any words of wisdom? Do you have any words of wisdom just to leave our listeners with? The most important journey you'll take in your life is inward. Somebody once said that the distance between the brain and the heart is the shortest and it's also the longest distance in the world. We get so disconnected in the society. So that inner journey of reconnection with the self really is the most worthwhile trip you'll ever take. And that's why a lot of people who've healed from addiction, who've recovered, and by the way, when you look at the word recovery, what does that mean? It means you found something. 
That's what it means to recover. You find something. What do people find? They find themselves. And so a lot of people will actually say, despite my terrible addiction, I'm so grateful for it because in healing from it, I found myself. So whether you're addicted or not, look for yourself. Beautiful way to wrap up, Gabor. And we're going to link everything up over at ultimatehealthpodcast.com for the listeners. And we just want to thank you so much. This has been a great conversation and there's just so much here for the listeners to really dig into. Thank you both. It's a great pleasure to speak with you. Thank you. We hope you guys enjoyed today's episode with Gabor. So much important information around the area of addiction. This is something that needs to be addressed as so many people are experiencing this. And we'd love to know what you think of today's show. So let us know over in our Facebook group. This is where the conversation happens in between episodes. People get to ask their questions. Jesse and I are in there to answer them. And you guys are also in there to answer them and engage with each other. So come on over to ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash community and get engaged and meet some of your fellow listeners. Be sure and check out the full show notes over at ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash 259. We have links there to everything we discussed in a show summary. Before we let you guys go, I want to give some love to our editor and engineer, Jay Sanderson, over at podcasttech.com. Jay, thanks for doing such a great job putting the show together. And this week's fun fact about Jace is that he's starting to feel the cold weather creeping in in the UK, and he's not liking it one bit. Jace, I know the cold weather is coming here soon too, and I can totally relate. Listeners, have an awesome week. We'll talk soon. Take care.